Welcome to the AgriForward CDT seminar series. Um, this is the 11th talk and the last for this academic year, and then we will restart in September. And before we go into the details of today's talks, um, let's remind and let's help us to, uh, um, to find new PhD students. So MC, MSc and PhD places are available with round one starting in October 2020. 21 so yeah more more to do and, and more position available please um consider this and spread the information to 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 everybody that could be interested uh today's talk is about uh, modeling and control on plant pathogens uh nick is from plant science is a senior lecturer in uh, mathematical biology at the university of cambridge uh and um, he leads research in quantitative epidemiology, which is something that finally has been recognized as fundamentally important, even by the wider public, now that we are under this sorry time of COVID, but has been always a fundamental science. And what Nick is doing is deriving stochastic model and control strategy to handle and understand epidemiology at fundamental level. So, his, his, his research has been finally uh, recognized also by the wider public, but there are so many applications, and one of those is indeed in, in, in plant science, where, where we need to understand how pathogen spreads, which is a fundamental problem, a, a really a real concern in, in, in agriculture. Um, so without any further delay, I'm happy to, to, to leave the floor to Nick, and please, Nick, go ahead. So hopefully you can see um, my slides and hear me. Yeah, very well. Perfect. Thanks. So thank you everyone for coming to, to my talk today or viewing my talk today. Um, thank you for the introduction too. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about how you can use mathematical modeling to understand the spread of plant pathogens. Uh, and one very compelling reason to understand the spread of plant pathogens using a model is to understand how to control them better. I'm afraid I'm not going to say anything at all about robotics. So I, I hope that isn't too much of a disappointment for some of you. It isn't really my field. But I do see some ways in which people involved in this program and people like me can work together, hopefully as I'll persuade you of over the course of the talk. So in particular, um, I'm going to focus on tree pests and diseases. So the sorts of models that I'm going to talk about have really quite wide application. And there are other groups in the plant sciences department who are really focused on agricultural pathogens. Some of the work I talk about is relevant to agricultural pathogens. So on the slide here. Um, the citrus canker and citrus greening, they're both bacterial diseases of, of citrus trees, but the models are kind of agnostic to the pathogen, at least to some extent that you're thinking of, so it would work for fruit trees in the UK too. Um, really, this slide is supposed to emphasise how applicable the models are and how they're somewhat generic. So there's a couple of pathogens that are vectored, so Dutch elm disease was vectored by a beetle, um, and citrus greening is vectored by a, a, a sort of wasp. Um, there's different genera of... Uh, Pathogen. So there's Uromycete pathogens like Phytophthora or Morum, from the same genus uh, as potato lake blight, which I'm sure all of you would have heard of. There's fungal pathogens like Clara Lash dieback and Dutch elm disease. There's even insect pests, which can be modelled in, well, in very similar ways, at least. I'm not going to have time to talk about all of these case studies, so I'm just going to take a few. And the first case study I'm going to discuss is citrus canker. So I'll say a little bit about citrus canker, because unless you're either American or Brazilian, it may not have really entered your consciousness. Um, so citrus canker is a bacterial disease of citrus, and it can affect most citrus cultivars. So citrus genetics is incredibly complicated. Lots of hybridization for the, for the fruit you eat, uh, live underneath the fruit you eat, at least. Um, but most species of citrus that are grown commercially are at least somewhat susceptible to, uh, susceptible to citrus canker. Um, it spreads by windborne rain. So you can see what, looking at this picture here, you can see a leaf of a, a citrus tree that's been infected by citrus canker. You can see a lesion. Um, so what's happened here is the bacteria has pen bacterium has penetrated the leaf, caused the lesion which spreads over the leaf. That lesion leads to new bacteria and that uh, turns the disease cycle. Um, fruit can also become infected. So I I'm not a great lover of orange juice myself, but even if I was, I probably wouldn't fancy uh, eating these oranges very much. They'll certainly not be marketable were well, a citrus uh, producer. Um, also, the, the juice of the fruit becomes slightly sour, so you can't even use them for juicing. And it causes the trees to uh, be affected by a fruit drop. So again, I'm not a specialist in citrus agronomy, but I can look at that citrus tree and very quickly work out that it's not entirely healthy because the fruit that you'd want to take as your yield have, have fallen to the floor. 
So in, in talking about citrus canker, I, I'd like to kind of emphasize a couple of underpinning epidemiological questions. And as was introduced just before I started speaking, these, some of these at least are incredibly close to our consciousness now. Um, so the first question I'd like to think about is how you can successfully control a disease, even when individuals, so in this case plants, which are infected, remain cryptic. And what cryptic means in plant disease epidemiology, at least, is able to infect without showing symptoms. So it's certainly the case, although the symptoms I showed you on the last slide were quite severe, and anyone would see, a, if a plant was showing those symptoms, anyone who looked at that plant, that tree, would notice that it, there was something wrong. Often the, severe, the symptoms can be much milder, and it can be difficult to unambiguously identify infected trees. Of course, this, this has parallels with the, the epidemic or the pandemic we're living through now. Um, the second question is that the, the modelling that I'm going to present isn't incredibly complicated, but there's some complexity to it. And in order for the modelling to be useful, the messages that come out of the modelling have to be translated to stakeholders, so decision makers, policy makers. Really. And so that takes some, some attention. So really, I'd like to talk a little bit or think a little bit or show really a little bit about how reasonably complicated inferences for mathematical model, modellers can be presented to stakeholders. And then the third question, the question really which drives a large part of my research programme, um, is about how you can improve control of disease by including more epidemiology. So once you have a model in place that tells you about the epidemiology of a pathogen, and the promise of having a model is by understanding the epidemiology better, you can design more elaborate control strategies which are likely to work better. I should acknowledge other people who are involved in this work. So a main collaborator here is Tim Gottwald. He recently retired from the USDA. Um, Richard Start is a postdoc in the plant sciences department. And Chris Gilligan is a professor in the plant sciences department. So a lot of the work that I'm going to describe today was done in collaboration with Chris. So I'll say a bit more about um, the history of citrus canker. So citrus canker actually entered America. So the center of origin is somewhere in Southeast Asia. Citrus canker entered uh, Florida and was successfully eradicated twice in the 20th century towards the beginning of the 20th century. However, we know that sometime before 1995, it entered uh, Miami uh, again. So this series of maps shows um, the results of a really detailed and really quite expensive surveillance program where people from the USDA went out and looked and saw at quite a fine spatial scale whether they could find um, symptoms of plants that were infected by citrus canker. Um, of course, this is actually over Miami, so we're quite close to Miami Airport. I think that's probably no coincidence because uh, the consensus is that the pathogen was entered, introduced into Florida um, on some sort of infected plant material which came into the airport. Um, people in uh, of Miami and all over Florida are lucky enough to live in a climate where they can grow citrus trees in their backyards. So the trees that would be being infected here aren't commercial trees, um, so with ones which are grown to harvest the fruit. Uh, they're ones which people grow to, well, supposed to harvest the fruit, but not commercially, just in their backyards, really. And what you can see over a sequence of three years is the spread of the pathogen. This bar here is about 10 miles long. So you can see that this pathogen was spreading really quite widely even within the first three years um, of after it entered um, Florida. The real concern though was the agricultural industry. So further north in Florida, there's huge areas which are turned over to citrus cultivation, so vast citrus globes. And were they to be in, become infected by citrus canker, then that would cause the problems that the, you know, the plants on the, on the right, they, that their fruits are unmarketable. So that was to be avoided. So nothing was really done for three years while the regulatory response was being worked through. And then in 1998, a regulatory response was introduced. And that response was quite aggressive. There aren't any really effective controls against citrus canker. You can spray with copper, uh, a copper-based spray, which acts as a bacteria size, so kills bacteria. You can't do that very often um, because it's probably not very good for human health. So the control that's essentially done is a sort of removal of host plants. Um, because um, citrus canker can lead to infections being invisible or certainly invisible for some period while they're infecting. You can't just remove the plants that you detect to have symptoms of citrus canker. In all likelihood, if you find a tree which is infected, some of its near neighbours will also be infected. So this is the underpinning reason for the control that was introduced, and it was a control of, of removal out to a certain radius. So there's a regular programme of detection, people going and scouting, looking at individual citrus trees for symptoms of citrus canker. And if a tree with symptoms of citrus canker was detected, then all of the trees within a certain radius were removed. So on the left hand side, so in this picture here, you can see this, ignore this part here, the rectangular block is just to do with the agronomy of citrus, that whole block's been pushed just to replant with younger with young trees. Here and here and here and here, you can see the shadow of one of these removals. 
So what had happened was in the middle of each of these circles, an infected tree was found. And so all of the trees surrounding that tree within a certain radius had to be removed. Um, this was done for four years out to a Americans don't always work in metric units. So this was done um, for four years out to 12, 125 foot, so it's about 40 meters or so. Um, and in 2002, it was noticed that the, the, the aim of the program eradicating the pathogen just wasn't happening. So the um, radius was dramatically increased to 1900 foot. That's quite a long distance, you know, that's 600 meters or, so, or just under 600 meters. So you can imagine that if a tree were to become infected in this citrus grove, essentially this whole block here would be removed. You can see this on the right where um, the scale of this map is really quite big. This bar here is 10 miles and the individual circles you can see are removal radii around detected trees. This went on for another four years. So it cost an incredible amount of money because there's all these trees which are being removed. There's all this effort in, in doing the removal, the cost of removal, not to, not to mention the cost to the growers. There's also a massive cost in detection, but control was abandoned in 2006. So the pathogen was declared to be uneradicatable um, after the USDA had spent just over a billion dollars, um, or an estimated billion dollars upon it. So I guess what this want, makes us want to think about, or makes me want to think about, is, is, why, is this, why did this happen? Why was so much money spent um, and, and so essentially so little reward gained for it? And there's a number of reasons, but two particular reasons that I, I think are important in the epidemiology as shown on this slide. So the first one um, is to do with the date and the timing. The timing of 2006 is no surprise. Um, the reason, the real reason the eradication program was abandoned in 2006 was that in 2005, there were a series of, of hurricanes um, which swept through uh, Florida. The most famous is Hurricane Wilma, which is shown on this slide here. What I didn't say earlier on is the way citrus canker spreads from tree to tree. So the uh, bacteria is airborne and is most effectively transmitted when it's windy and rainy because it needs moisture um, in order to infect trees that it lands upon. So what this means is if you were to design a program to, to uh, disperse this pathogen around, <laughs> around the state, what you essentially designed as a hurricane. So at that point, it became far too widely dispersed. The other reason underpinning this or underpinning the failure or possible reason underpinning the failure is shown by the two news articles um, th this program of tree removal was incredibly unpopular with certain people and it kind of makes sense so by the end of the program if a, if a tree was detected to show symptoms of citrus canker 600 meters away or just at least just under 600 meters away then your tree in your backyard would have to be removed so I think the Golden Girls of Pinecrest on the right weren't happy with this. And, and this man here, if you read the headline, he was even less happy about this. And this is indicative of the sort of reaction that certain stakeholders had to this, this programme of removal. They, they saw it that the, the needs of the citrus industry were outweighing their needs. And I think that's to some extent that's fair. So with all this background, though, what, what, can, what can a modeler bring to the table? Well, given I started working on the system in 2007, uh, not much for this particular epidemic. But of course, when something has gone wrong, that offers a chance for you to learn from, from, from that experience and, and see what could be done better next time. So Tim Gottwell was involved in, um, as I say, he's one of the collaborators. He was involved in the response in the USDA. And he, he had quite a foresightful um, he did quite a foresightful thing in 1999. Um, and what he did was he set up some sites within which the citrus trees were regularly and intensively surveyed. So within these sites, they're not that big. They're of the order of, say, a kilometre by a kilometre. Um, and this one, these ones are slightly bigger. Um, someone went and looked at the disease status of all of the citrus trees in each of these sites every 30 days. So what this leads to is a data set something like this. So this is the B2 site. Looking at it from above, um, it, each yellow dot here is a citrus tree in someone's backyard or in a park. And the data set would then, which uh, Tim collected, would then look something like this. So 30 days, 60 days, 120 days. You can see sign that when it says susceptible and infected here, really what it means is not showing symptoms and showing symptoms in red. And this gives us some information about how the pathogen spreads. So this information is kind of Bristol Modeler's Mill because it allows you to fit mathematical models. So again, as, as per the introduction to this talk, some of the ideas here may, I've given, I've talked about this system before, and certainly I talked about this system before 2019, or 2020, sorry. Um, and I think very few people in the audience would necessarily have, have heard or thought about the idea of modeling a disease using a mathematical model or a compartmental model or any of these ideas. Some of these ideas are much more familiar, 
but I'll say something about them nevertheless. So in order to model this system, one way of doing it would be to divide individuals, so trees here, according to their disease status. And the model that was used um, partitioned into five separate disease statuses or six because there's two sorts of removal. So trees start off being S susceptible, so they're healthy, they're not yet infected. Then if something causes them to become infected, and I'll talk about this transition in a second, but if something causes them to become infected, an individual tree, it moves to the exposed compartment. So what that is, is a tree which is infected, but is not yet infectious and is not next symptomatic. So for the sort of control that we were talking about, where you remove trees um, based on where you see symptoms, they're, they're kind of inert. They can't spread the disease and they can't trigger control. The next compartment, which would be entered, so essentially this is a one-way road. Once a tree enters the E compartment, it will move through the compartments in turn, from, unless you remove it yourself. So you go through E, C, I, and R. Um, C corresponds to cryptic infection. So those are trees which are infectious, but not yet um, symptomatic. C corresponds, to, uh, I corresponds to infected. So that corresponds to trees which are both symptomatic and infectious to others. And then eventually citrus canker would kill a tree, but not at a massively larger rate than, than natural death, in fact, for citrus canker. But there's a removed compartment which corresponds to dead hosts. Um, because of the control that's in the model as well, uh, hosts in any compartment can enter the R class and you might call them RC. So all of the, the, the information or the hardness in this type of model really is wrapped up in this transition here. So this is saying how fast does an individual susceptible tree move from being susceptible to being exposed, which mean, means it has just been infected. And that's shown in this functional form here. I'm not going to kind of go into the details of the mathematics too much. I'll say that it relies upon something called a dispersal kernel. Um, the dispersal kernel is shown here on a, a logarithmic scale. Two possible dispersal kernels are shown here. What a dispersal kernel does is it reflects the idea and quantifies um, the idea, I suppose, of how the probability of infection being transmitted from an infected host to a susceptible host goes down with distance. So it kind of stands to reason that the further away an, an individual uh, susceptible host is from an infected, the smaller a chance it would, um, it would, there would be for it to become infected. Um, and you can quantify that um, using a functional form. Essentially what you do is you, using a reasonably complicated fitting methodology, you fit a functional form, the results of which when used as a dispersal kernel um, best match your data. The other thing to say is you can do this. So again, this is something I'm not going to go into in too much detail, but this is the results of the estimation done for different portions of the epidemic. If only that's so on the x-axis, this is a probability density. On the x-axis is um, a measure of how far the pathogen disperses, so a parameter which is involved in the dispersal kernel. And on the y-axis is a measure of your degree of belief that that is that any given value on the x-axis is the correct value. So if you use just the information from the first three months of the epidemic, your, your posterior density is, is really quite wide. You can't say that much about how the pathogen disperses because you haven't observed the process for very long. But as you observe more and more of the epidemic, these distributions become, well, firstly, tighter and higher. That shows you're more confident. And secondly, concordant. So within nine months or so, there's enough information revealed from the data to begin to estimate something about how the pathogen disperses. So... One of the things I mentioned in my introduction was about communication with stakeholders. So as part of um, this work, an interface was concocted. I didn't actually write the front end part here. I, I wrote the model which lives underneath it. But th this interface still exists. So if, if you were interested in having watched this talk, you could go to uh, www.webademics.com and start to play with the model I'm about to show. Um, it all looks slightly different. So the, the original interface was written in Adobe Flash and that got killed off by Steve Jobs, I think, last year. So it's now in a, in a different technology, but essentially has the functionality I'm about to show you. And it, where you to go there, you might see something like this. It's an interactive interface. You can play with um, bars which control the parameterization of the model and things like that. And here you can see, or what you can see, is the an, an attempt to control an epidemic spreading through a population, a hypothetical population of citrus trees. So each little dot is a citrus tree. And you can see, as the movie plays out, citrus trees moving through the compartments I just mentioned. Uh, healthy, so susceptible, exposed, critically infected. They're the dangerous ones. They're the ones which can spread the pathogen around, but you can't see infected and then different sorts of dead. And the other thing you can see on the interface as you see the wave kind of playing out is um, you can see the gray circles appear. So what those gray circles appear, what's causing those gray circles to appear, sorry, is essentially is a little computerized man who's running around and every 30 days is examining each tree. 
and probabilistically finding a certain fraction of those which are in the infectious um, compartment, so those which are showing symptoms. And then that computerized man says, okay, you've got to cut down within a certain radius around the tree that, tree that I found. As you can see, the control isn't doing an amazing job. So the control is, let's say the wave of disease is just outrunning the wave of, of con control. So each time it, the control doesn't quite cut down enough trees. And so the disease carries on and persists in the population. You end up removing almost all of the trees. Thing is, with a mathematical model, though, so this, this gives us a handle, doesn't it? So the, the, these, these numbers that were used by the USDA, 125 and what was it, 1900, they seem suspiciously round to me. And the reason they're suspiciously round is they were essentially... Um, uh, concocted by a process of, of asking experts there was no there was, there was some quanti quantitative basis for them but it isn't the sort of quantitative basis that i'm about to present with a mathematical model you can imagine running your model lots and lots of times for different control radii and seeing what happens so that's what what was done so were you to do this you get a graph something like this so what's going on this is quite a complicated graph so on the x-axis is um the radius of removal that's used in the model and on the y-axis is the number of hosts that are removed. And you can be removed because you become infected, or you can be removed because someone cut you down. That's the two ways you can be removed as a tree. And it's important to note that this is for quite a small population of only 2,000 trees on quite a restricted domain. So the quantitative nature of the optimum radius isn't necessarily what you'd expect to use in a, in a big place like Florida. It's just to get the, the idea across of, of that there is this radius and how it might respond to parameters in, inside your model. That was the point of, of this, this work, I suppose. But I should say some more about the, the shape of the response. So what's going on? We saw um, something like this on the last slide. If the radius of control is too small, what's going to happen? Well, you're not going to remove enough, um, enough trees. You're going to remove the tree that's infected. You might remove a few of its neighbours. But you're, the, there's always, across the population, going to be a reasonable chance that at least one tree who is um, infected or exposed at least escapes your control. And so you're forever just sort of chasing your tail or chasing the epidemic. On the other other side of the response, again, this is fairly clear. I, I've got a way of, of eradicating citrus canker from, from Florida. It's not a way which would be palatable to any grower, but you could remove every citrus plant from the whole of Florida. And then you haven't got a problem with citrus canker, of course, but you've got all sorts of other problems because you've removed every, every citrus plant. And essentially, that's what you're seeing here. If you, if you use a very, very large radius, you very quickly eradicate the pathogen but you'd, at the cost of removing very many healthy hosts. So in between, there'll be some optimum at which the control is optimised. And because the model is stochastic, it's, it, it, you know, the, the mathematical model isn't deterministic, it's different, um, you know, initial condition each time with the randomization process in it. So each time you run your epidemic in, in your population, it will work slightly differently. Um, you get a, a range of outcomes each radius. So there are some questions about how even you set the optimum, do you look for the best medium response or um, the very worst it can be? You might choose that, that radius there. There's, there's some questions there, but I won't go to those. So what, what I introduced there was one, one thing that you, you may, may do if you're controlling an epidemic, and that is a plant disease epidemic, at least, and that's to go and control out to a constant radius. But of course, that's very simple. So Sam, a student of mine, and I wondered if we could do better by including more epidemiology. And this, again, poses some questions. So the sorts of questions you might care about, are, well, how the well does this work? Can these sorts of strategies be made transparent? So if the idea of cutting to a constant radius is unpopular with people, then um, something more complicated, maybe even more popular. And then a really important question is, what if we're not working retrospectively? So what if the parameter, our knowledge of the parameters isn't perfect? If it's the case you know everything about how a, a pathogen is spreading, then in principle at least, designing control strategies is easy. But often you're in a situation where you're learning about the parameterization of your model at the same time as the control is, is, is being done. So. As a proxy for that problem in this work, what we're using is an idea that there's a systematic imprecision in your knowledge of the parameters. Well, that's some other work that I'm not going to talk about today addresses exactly that problem where um, you're learning and doing at precisely the same time. So, so thinking about it, you know, this, this is a schematic, and this is supposed to this schematic is supposed to illustrate the sorts of things that might go wrong in the constant radius control that I just just showed you even when it was being done, let's say, at the optimal radius. And then what the schematic is showing is a population of, of individual plants, so citrus trees, I suppose, um, and the results of a single survey. So at some point in time, someone has gone and examined all of these plants and um, has determined that four of them, the four red dots, those plants are symptomatic. Um, very likely, some of the green plants, which are asymptomatic, are infected. The idea of using the constant radius is to get the right ones. 
but let's see how that might go wrong. So were we to use a certain radius, we have to call it R here, and do that control radius around all of the infected plants. So you see the four infected as four circles um, around, around each one of the infected plants as a circle. And then what that does is it certainly removes some hosts, but it leaves some behind. And let's think about uh, a couple of case studies, a couple of uh, life stories of a couple of the hosts that have been sadly left behind. So, so here's one. This host here it is not quite close enough to any of the infected hosts to have been removed. But it, th this host, this plant is getting in the neck from all sides. It's, it's, it's in between, very close to the middle of um, four hosts which were infected. So it might be reasonable to think that that host is, is somehow facing a larger risk of being infected. So it might be reasonable to remove that host if you were trying to do better. And, and the other one I might think about is this host here, which is in a clump of hosts, which are all very close together. So all other things being equal, there's not much more reason to imagine that, that this host here is any more likely to be infected than this host here. They're both equally dis equidistant from, from an infected. But this host poses a problem and the reason this post host is a problem is because it's in a very dense region of hosts. So were it to become infected, that could mean that the disease would be able to spread quite quickly. So I guess I'm glossing over the mathematical details. I'm, I am happy to try and talk about mathematical details, but it's quite difficult to get across in a talk. Um, what this, th these observations lead to is, well, firstly, a notion that if you think about the risk posed by a host to other hosts, you might be able to do better in control. And secondly, a mathematical expression, which you can figure out what that risk should be by thinking about the product of two quantities. The chance that an individual host has become cryptically infected and multiply that by the rate at which it would infect other hosts were it to be infected. And that gives you a notion of how much risk that host poses to, to the rest of the world. The thing is, this is quite a, di a complicated dynamic property uh, quantity because certainly we're well, both parts are dynamic, but this part here, the probability a host is cryptically infected. So what, what does that even mean? What that means is that something, your, your algorithm for deciding where to control, examines the results of each successive survey. So each time someone goes and looks at the, at the population of host trees, for more information comes in. And that information updates the, the estimate inside the control algorithm of the probability that each host is infected. So the survey data drop directly drives that. And then the rate it would affect other hosts, that's going to depend upon removal. So, you know, the reason this host here poses um, a large risk to, I, I suggested this host might pose a large risk were it to be infected, is that there's lots of hosts which are close by. But if some of those have been removed, that wouldn't be close, no, that, that risk wouldn't be felt anymore because they've been removed already. So both of these are dynamic quantities, can be quite complicated. So because it's quite complicated, you know, that, that, that might be quite difficult for people to, to get behind. As essentially, a quite complicated computer algorithm is saying you have to remove this host and this host and this host. Um, we, we can't quite tell you why we have to remove this host and this host and this host, but trust us, it, it, that's the right thing to do. That, that's not necessarily a message that would go down well. So we thought about a simpler approximation to this risk-based control, which is a variable range control. It just in, in, encapsulates one part of the risk-based control. So as I just sort of outlined, the risk-based control is, is complicated in dyna a dynamic quantity, and it might be difficult for people to, to get behind. So we also tested out a simplification, which is to use a variable radius control. So this is the most obvious to me, at least, generalization of the um, constant radius control that I talked about before, where at different points in space, um, a different control radius is used. And the obvious thing to, again, obvious is in either a holder, but to me, the obvious thing to, to focus on was um, some measure of how rapidly a pathogen would spread were a host to be infected. Again, this is something which is more familiar than it would have been a while ago. It's based on the local value of R0, um, so essentially the idea which underpins um, R in the, the COVID forecast you see, saw in the news last year. So for this system, this, this is actually the real, uh, one of the real landscapes which data were taken from for citrus canker um, in this landscape in this area of space hosts are quite tightly clumped so you would expect where one host to become infected it would be rapidly uh, be able to infect others whereas say over here in fact uh, the hosts are quite far away from one another and so well one of these hosts to become infected it would infect a few others and so that could be um, encapsulated by this you'd expect to have a lot need a larger control radius here than you would here so we tested these things out and there's a movie showing the, 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 the performance of these two strategies. The, the risk-based control is, is kind of difficult to tell what's going on. That's that somehow baked into the system. It does 
um, remove some hosts. And, and the, I mean, in both cases, we're just thinking about an epidemic running on this small host population. Um, and we're thinking about an epidemic which started with, uh, a, I think, two infected hosts some different places each time, I think. Um, and then we're allowing the epidemic to run until local eradication, to, so until we eradicate it locally. And then our measure of how well we've done is the number of removed hosts at the end. So, as I say, the risk-based control, it can be difficult to understand, but here in this individual replicate simulation, um, the disease was eradicated um, at a cost of 317 removals. The variable radius you might have might have seen, if I, if I play the movie again, do you see this? Um, yeah, you can see that the radius of, of control is different, different places in space, and there's some um, mechanistic, it's probably not quite the right word, but there's some rational rationale for choosing different um, radii in different places in space. And that performs, um, well, is already performing less well, and yeah, it eradicates the pathogen with, at the cost of 382 removals. Um, the thing is, and in both cases, both of these, these strategies have been optimised in kind of the same way as the variable radius um, strategy that I talked about before. So the variable radius, you could work out the one true best variable radius over our whole ensemble of runs and, and then use that going forward. Both of these strategies, um, they both rely upon tunable parameters. And what I'm considering here is the performance for the optimum value of those tunable parameters. So were we to, to think about that in slightly more detail, what I just showed you was a single replicate simulation. But of course, uh, with a stochastic model, different things can happen each time. So again, this is a probability density. It shows the final epidemic size, so essentially the number of removals at the time you eradicate the pathogen, and the density of probability, so how likely each outcome is. And the point is that the risk-based control um, density, or you know, essentially it's like a histogram of outcomes, isn't it? Um, the risk-based control strategy is further to the left that corresponds to on average a smaller epidemic size sometimes it does worse so is it perfectly possible that you could have 500 removals under the risk-based control and you could only have 200 removals under the variable radius control but average over a large number of epidemics the, the risk-based control is best and then the variable radius control um, then the constant radius control that we i talked about at the start so essentially adding more epidemiology works and as you would have seen in the um in the movie where you eagle eyed enough, it, it turns out that for this landscape, it's driven by a preemptive remote removal. So on round one of removal, or possibly round two of removal, um, high risk hosts tended to be removed. So certain hosts were removed very, very, very often in the risk-based control because the, the idea, the algorithm figured out that they posed such a large risk to the rest of the world were they to be infected, it was worth removing them even if the disease was sometimes quite far away. So this is a robust result. It works for you know, different dispersal scales. So I mentioned about the parameterization of the dispersal curve with different infection rates. It's the south. If, if you're interested, you look at Sam's paper and there's many, many, many. Um, we have access to a big computer. So there's many, many, many sensitivity analyses um, to, to show that, that, that this ordering of strategies, what's being plotted here is the mean epidemic size or possibly the mode epidemic size. I don't, I don't remember, but some measure of on average how big the epidemics are. In all cases, the red line is lowest. So that means that the risk-based control is doing best. The more interesting result is maybe this one. So this idea that the complex strategies can degrade if prior knowledge is poor. So uh, this is quite a busy graph. So I'll try and step you through it um, to try and make it understandable. So what, what the, the, the upside down triangle refers to is what you thought you knew before the epidemic started. So you're not, your best estimate of the infection, this would work, essentially the idea I'm about to give across would work for all of the parameters in the model, but the infection rate was the one we chose. So imagine we knew everything perfectly, we didn't know the infection rate. Um, we thought before the epidemic came in that the infection rate was 3.6 times 10 to the minus four, or whatever this upside down triangle value actually happens to be. Then you can imagine that when the epidemic comes in, the infection rate is bigger or smaller. You know, so you you had some systematic inaccuracy in your estimation, and that's what's being shown by the the, the where you are on the x-axis of this graph. So let's focus on a point to make it simple. Imagine that it was the case the infection rate was much larger; it was about double. It was six. What would happen? Well, what would happen um, depends upon the estimated infection rate and really the influence that your prior knowledge has upon the whole process. That initial knowledge or prior knowledge of what the infection rate you think it is at the time you start your control it's used for two things it's used to do the optimization of the control strategies so all of these control just like the, the the constant radius control in order to talk about the best constant radius control you have to do an optimization process over possible radii 
and then go ahead and use that. That's what was used in the constant radius control. The risk space and variable radius radio control also have these tunable thresholds. So if you thought the control, the parameterization should be 3.7 before the epidemic started spreading, that's the value you'd use to find those thresholds. So it's used to optimize the strategy beforehand. And it's also used inside the, the, the algorithm, which um, determines um, the, the, the risk-based control. An estimate is come to of the chance that a host is critically infected. Well, to come to that estimate based on the survey data. So to come to that estimate of the chance of an individual host being critically infected based on the survey data, you, you need to have some notion of how fast the pathogen is spreading. So that this prior knowledge is used there too. And it turns out that if the infection rate, which is actually used, um, in the simulations upon which you test test these pre-optimized control strategies is wildly different, then the risk-based control actually does worse than the variable-based control. So there's kind of a, a lesson for us all here is, is the sort of maxim, isn't it? That, you, you know, if you don't do, know too much, you shouldn't try and be too flash, I guess is the is the maxim here. Um, if not much is known in advance, then, then simpler strategies are better. And as I say, one more technical piece of work, so I chose not to talk about today, although i would happy to talk to people about it, is something about how the, this, this picture looks when you're learning the parameters as you're doing the control. So that's where my real interest perhaps lies now. So I'm going to move scales and move, move patho systems. Um, I'm a I apologise to those of you who are interested. To those of you who are interested in robotics, I've said nothing <laughs> that's going to be interesting. Um, to those of you who are interested in agriculture, now I'm going to start talking about a, a, tr a pure tree pathogen in, which works in the natural world. Hopefully you'll see some sorts of parallel, though, uh, between the pathogen I'm going to talk about and the sorts of pathogen you're interested in, if you are interested in pathogens. It is also, also from the same genus as the potato like, like pathogens. And I'm going to talk about phytophthora or more, the cause of sudden oak there. So I'll say a little bit about Phytophthora morum. Again, it's not something you, you may may not have heard of. Um, so it's an inv exotic invadive, invasive pathogen in northwestern Europe, UK and the USA. So there's large epidemics um, caused by this UMIC in the, in the UK, certainly in parts of the USA, in other European countries. Uh, and one of the things that makes it difficult to control is it's a generalist. So it, the pathogen is able to infect many tree and shrub species. The largest epidemic is in California. So the pathogen's been spreading there since around 1990, at least to the best of our knowledge. And it has killed literally millions of, of, of oak trees. So these coast live oaks, which um, are desiccated are, and are going to die soon. Um, well, if they're not already dead, they're well on the way to, to being dead. Um, you can see here um, an oozing lesion on the bark of a tree. That's a very characteristic symptom of sudden oak death. Um, and the, the name comes because um, the the, the, the pathogen or the, the disease is named sudden oak death because for a number of years oaks in California were dying and that quite quickly and no one knew why so but it was then determined the cause was by more and more. Um, the pathogen's also been in the UK for the best part of 20 years now uh, and in one of these sort of interesting things that happens in, in plant disease epidemiology the, the pathogen was introduced uh, near Cornwall uh, and people were worried but it was mainly affecting shrub, uh, shrub vaccinia but what happened in 2009 is there was a detection of um, this pathogen upon large trees and then suddenly the, the regulator became much much more interested the reason for this is the larch is grown as a commercial crop so that you have uh, what you say stands of larch which are growing in order to harvest their wood and they were starting to get infected by, by uh, more by more so since 2009 there's been well two things a, a big modeling effort um, to, to understand how best to control the pathogen um, and also there have been regular tree removal, so uh, cutting down statutory orders which insist that certain trees should be cut down because um, infection has been found nearby. Exactly the same as what I described for citrus tangle, but just a much larger stand. And here on the right, you can see something about the, um, the epidemic spread um, or the state of the epidemic in 2010, 2012, I think, in, in California. So here there's a, another big question uh, to do with large scale control. And uh, the big question is, how do you do it? So these are the people that I work with. I won't go through them all by name, um, but we considered how to do this by looking at models. The way we did this, I just noticed at the time, so I'm gonna speed go a little bit faster. Sorry that I've run a little bit over, so I'll, I'll get through this, but um, need to speak a bit quicker, I think. Um, essentially it's exactly the same as the citrus canker example, just a, a very different spatial stack. So, we were interested in the spread across the whole of California. Whole of California. Um, so the way we tackle this is by dividing California up into squares. And each square contains a certain number of hosts which can be infected by uh, 
well, more the pathogen that causes sudden oak death. Um, and there's many hosts that go into the color that's shown um, in, in this map, which is essentially a density, the density of how many hosts there are um, in each location. There's, there's no hosts here, but there's lots on the northwest coast. Within each square, there's a compartmental model running, so susceptible, cryptic, infected, infected and detected. So for this pathogen, there's never enough money to, um, to, to control everything you wish to. So you, there can be a situation where you know an individual place has um, infection in it, but you haven't got enough money to cut it down now, so you remember that for later. Um, the infection rate is forced by the weather, so at this sort of spatial scale, um, you can't um, make any sort of assumption that the infection is happening at a constant rate. You have to account for the idea that the climate here is different to the climate here, and that's done by using uh, maps of weather data. And again, it's been fitted to spread data here at two spatial scales, but I'll, I'll cross over that a bit. So we did this and, and ran our mathematical model, and here's the results. What you can see is the epidemic starts quite slowly, um, but gets going over time. This is incredibly large spatial scale we're thinking about. So the number of trees that are infected by 2020 is predicted to be incredibly large. Um, and you can see this in this, this graph here. So this shows the disease progress curve. So um, on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, is time in years since the introduction in 1990. And on the y-axis is the area of, area of forest, which is uh, infected by remora. So essentially, uh, spreads very slowly then gets going and explosively kicks off, as you'd expect for any epidemic. So when I did this work um, was around 2015, so it took about something slightly old. And the reason it, it was interesting to start thinking about control was that this explosive increase in the density of Romor um, was about to happen. So from 2015 to 2030, there's about a tenfold increase predicted. So using our model, we can um, think about certain scenarios. How can we control the epidemic or can we control the epidemic? I guess the second question gives away the answer to the first one. So when could we have controlled it? Essentially says, makes it clear we couldn't control it at that time. And then how can we optimize the deployment of control? So what, what you're seeing here is two videos. Essentially the principles underneath this are precisely the same as the individual base models that I've shown you already. It's the only difference is that we've rasterized um, the, the host landscape. That's, that's the sole difference. Um, so what is being compared and contrasted is um, averages over lots of simulation runs in two cases. On the left-hand side, no control is done at all. On the right-hand side, an absolutely massive budget. So enough budget was given to the controller that they could cut down, remove um, 200 square kilometers of forest per year. So that's equivalent to the entire budget of the relevant agency um, in the USA. And of course, cutting down that area of forest would, would have all sorts, would cause all sorts of problems, even if you could afford it. But the idea here was just to show that control was essentially impossible. Looking at the two simulations or sets of simulations, it's very difficult to see any difference at all. There are some differences. So you can see the red and blue lines are slightly different on the right. There is an effect of control, but a very small one. <clears throat> and the reason for this is that um, if, if trees are cut down to an attempt to, to at any location, in an attempt to control the pathogen, um, very rapidly they re-sprout, very rapidly they're infected again by trees which are surrounding them, which also were infected. So the control essentially does nothing. At least if it was to start, if it was to start in 2014. But we you know, as I say, I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to have access to a big computer, so I could run my model lots of the model takes a little bit of time to run. I could run my model lots and lots of times um, for different areas that you could control per year. That's a measure of your budget, really, and times in which control was initiated. Um, where we were in the last slide was here. So we had an absolutely massive budget and started in 2014. As an arbitrary or semi arbitrary choice, let's think about what happened. Were we to start control in 2002 um, and to have a smaller budget, a quarter of the budget, still a large, very large budget, $25 million, I think it was, but um, you know, a, a, a smaller budget, nevertheless. 2002 wasn't entirely arbitrary. So um, reasons to focus on 2002 is that it was the time the pathogen was identified. Um, it was a time control started in Oregon. It's a small outbreak in Oregon. And it was a time that um, the EU, uh, the pathogen entered the EU. And so emergency measures um, were initiated. And finally, as a modeler, it's pragmatic. It gives you a response to optimize. If you can, if you, no matter what, what you do, if you had a budget, such a large budget and control started in 1996, then control would happen. Um, and similarly, as we showed, um, no matter what you do um, and how large your budget is, control starting in 2014 was never going to work. So there's only two more slides on this, so don't worry, I'm getting quite close to the end. But what I'll say about these slides is there's a concordance here, isn't there? So this slide here, or the graph on the left, 
is absolutely concordant with the graph that I showed of citrus canker. The same principle, same epidemiological principle is at play here. If you don't go far enough with your, on the x-axis of control radius, if you don't go far enough, you're not going to do very well. If you go too far, you're wasting money, um, and in between is best. And then depending upon the amount of the, the area you can cut down per year, which is a measure of your budget, um, you can go to different control radii. If you have a relatively small budget, you want to focus your control just on the locations you know are infected. Whereas if you've got a large budget, then you've got the kind of luxury of, control, of cutting down trees which are further away um, because you want to get ahead of the epidemic. And then the final thing that I'll say is about how you might optimise this type of control. So the last graphs I showed you were in the case where you, you, you know a list of, uh, as the person who's, who's running the policy, you know a list of all the places you found infection and infection is found by aerial flyover. I think the helicopters fly over, uh, light aircraft fly over and look for symptoms. So there's quite a long delay. Um, you, you've got a list of all of those places, but you probably can't afford to treat all of them. It's too expensive. Um, so you need some way of, of deciding which ones are those to treat. So one way of doing it, what we're showing on the last slide, is to do it essentially at random, at random within the set of hosts, places you know are infected, I would say. But there's other ways you might think about doing it. You know, a sensible thing, at least ostensibly, is to focus on places where there's most infection. That does absolutely terribly. The reason for that is places where there's most infection, you cut the thing down, it's going to get infected again. Turns out the best thing to do is to cut in the wave front. So the pattern of spread has a very strong signature of north to south spread. So it's spreading north quite slowly. Um, so the best thing to do, at least of the scenarios that I considered it, um, was to focus all of your efforts on the spreading wave of infection and really actively and hard treat there. And it turns out that has the best outcome. So I've got well, two more slides. So I said that before, but I, I would, was going to say something about the people. I'm, the, the, these are a collection of students that I work with, essentially my group. A couple have uh, just finished their theses. I won't say anything about their, their projects, but I'm happy to in questions if anyone would like to. And the other reason thing I should say is the reason I'm here is because Rachel hopefully is watching this. I hopefully hasn't watched this and decided she wants to do something else. Um, so Rachel is a student, an incoming student on your program. We're going to work together on a project about adaptive um, control and um, machine learning. So essentially how you can use machine learning to work out the best places to control. Um, this is a project with DEFRA and we're going to focus on uh, xylella, which is a pathogen, xylella fastidiosa. It's a pathogen of many uh, host species, a bit like uh, sudden oak death. There's a very large epidemic which is actively under control um, in, in Italy. And it goes, the, the, the iconic species which gets affected by it is olive trees. Some of these olive trees are 500 years old and they're being removed because of um, regulation in the EU. It's recently become of interest to death for as well. Recently, it's not quite right here, but you can see the date here. The legislation has recently been introduced. Um, one of our case study pathogens will be. So I that. At that point, I'll, I'll say my acknowledgements to my funders and to collaborators and to people who are either in or have been in my group. Um, and I'll apologise for overrunning. I'm really sorry that I went a little bit over. Um, and at this point, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Nick. This was very, very good, very, very instructive. And actually, I want to reassure you that uh, in spite of the fact that robotics seems uh, the, the science of doing things, there is so much data analysis to understand what to do that your talk is perfectly aligned with, with, with what we care about. Perfect. So um, please, if you have any question, just raise your hand and I will be happy to, to give you voice. Um, 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 in the meantime, I, I can break the ice with one question. Um, I was thinking about preemptive measures. So the, 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 this, this, this spreading of, of, of bacteria is also because we have a sort of monoculture. But if we geographically start to introduce a bit of heterogeneity in which some area are of one culture and then inter interleave with some other area of another culture, somehow this seems a very natural way to introduce some breaking points. But that's exactly right. So one thing that I, in fact, Ben, a student, one of the students that I was showing, his project title is um, Spatial Diversification of Host Plant Resistance Genes. So what you've come up with is a, a really uh, an excellent idea that people actively use where they grow depending upon the, the spatial scale you're working at you might call it a mixture where you know have, have a single field where you have different types of the same crop plant or you may talk about a spatial deployment strategy where different crops different crop varieties grown in different fields and the idea is to break exactly the, the problem that you just raised that if um if, if you're a plant pathogen uh, any cropping situation is absolutely is, is exactly what you want isn't it because it's a monoculture you can infect one of the plants you can infect all of them 
So this idea of spatial structuring is, is kind of an active area in heart disease epidemiology okay. research. Um, whether we, people, th there are people kind of working on it. I, I, I'd be very loath to say that we, we know anywhere near all the answers, <laughs> and anything it. near it. So the, the, there's different ways that people propose um, landscapes should be structured. I guess that depends upon um, the, the the differences between the, the the varieties that you're deploying and the different structure in the pathogen population that is attacking them. That can lead to different patterns. But it's not very well understood. It's a really interesting thing to think about. And along the same way, a very drastic measure of saying this area is lost. Let me cut away from this area. So you isolate the area, the area that is uh, that is infected in a very substantial way in order to preserve the wider area. Is this explored at all? Again, to... so yeah, well, that, that's often recommended, this idea of a barrier, or what is recommended, which is related, is the idea of a barrier. So okay. um, for, for sudden oak death, the, one of the slides I showed, I was, I'd sped up at that point, so I wasn't necessarily addressing everything that I, I, I would normally have said about. Um, for sudden oak death, there was the idea proposed that a certain valley somewhere in, in fairly north in California, there should be uh, a wide area, or, or sorry, a wide barrier cut in all of the hosts. So there's no host at all, a sort of dead zone. Um, and when that barrier is cut, the idea is that the pathogen would find it very difficult to, to, to get past it. The, the problem with that is, of course, when it has got past it, you may as well not have bothered at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of host barrier thing. It, it, it's often proposed by, by plant pathologists and regulators, but I don't know that I can think of an example where it's been successful. For xylella, they have different zones, but those zones are, um, so the pathogen I mentioned at the end, um, the idea is that in different parts of the boot of the, the heel of the boot of Italy, um, they do different things. So there's a, an area where essentially they're not actively controlling. There's an area where they're um, actively controlling. There's an area where they're looking harder. Those regions do move over time. Okay. okay. Um, so essentially they've, they've given up on the bottom bit. Thank you. Thank you. Fumia, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the interesting um, talk. So one of the potential solutions to this problem is uh, early detection, right? If you have uh, lots of samples and uh, many, many samples quicker, then yeah. uh, can, can you just give us a bit of elaboration? You know, what is the technical challenges if we want to do the really, really early detection of lots of samples? Sure. Well, for me, the challenge I'm most interested in, and one thing that I didn't talk about um, is how you would do the sampling. So no matter what your detection technology is, you've still got a choice to make unless your detection technology is um, infinitely cheap. So would it be possible to share my screen for one second again? Is that, is that okay? In, in yes, question? of course. I'll just check whether I can, I, I may not manage to do this. Let's see, can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. What I wanted to, ooh, so as I say, there were various things I, tried, I thought about talking about and didn't. Um, this slide here. So what you can see here, can, can you see my screen? I don't know what you can see. Yep. So what you can see here is the results of a kind of simulated annealing where we're thinking about where you would put your samples in order to find your epidemic most effectively. And that's a really quite difficult problem. You know, imagine that um, you, you could only put down a limited number of samples and imagine that you had a whole bunch of model runs which showed you where pathogens might go. The, the problem is that um, samples aren't independent from one another. Because if a place is located, a certain, sorry, a certain location is infected, its neighbour is more likely to be infected. So sampling in those two places, even if they're both at a very high risk of infection, doesn't bring you very much more information. So there's lots of questions around how to sample. What I haven't done, I think I've, have I just stopped my, stopped my sharing, I have had. Yeah. <clears throat> what I haven't done is answered your question. The challenges are that the symptoms are often quite difficult to discern. I think people, people that I don't directly interact with, but here, certainly talk they that there's many claims that by looking at the spectral signature of, of infected plants you can see very early and were you able to do that that would be amazing you know all of the problems that i everything that makes the epidemiology that i've talked about relevant and, and difficult and interesting is this idea of cryptic infection so were that problem to be solved or at least mitigated then we'd be in a much better place so were these sensors to become um widely applicable um that would be amazing but I'd still claim that unless they're um, infinitely cheap, you're going to need to give some attention to where you put them, and that's where epidemiology comes in. Thank you. Richard, please. 
Hi, Nick. Um, I was going to ask a really boring question about an isotropy. Your models seem very isotropic, but I want, naturally wanted to follow up now on just what you were saying, which was um, one way of spotting disease, I, I would have thought, is it's just an outlier in some sort of appearance measure. You know, whatever you're measuring, it's just, this tree looks weird. Oh. Right. Now, that could be very, we don't need to know it's a disease, we just know it's an outlier, unless the distribution of appearance is really broad already. <laughs> Is that viable, what I've just said, that, that it's a disease is just some outlier? For sure it is. It would, it would cause some difference. But I guess that the way that you characterise disease plants is that they spread. So it wouldn't be an outlier for long. No, so you say, well, this tree here, this is the most extreme tree in the forest. Let's cut it down and then <laughs> worry, worry about it later. You could certainly pose that. I, I don't know... A, a massive amount about the set of symptoms that trees show so I wouldn't necessarily back that as an idea without talking <laughs> to someone who has more knowledge on the topic. Okay uh, Rachel you asked uh, you raised your end but 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 I don't see that anymore so in case you wanted to, to, to say something please let me know in the meantime oh yes. Uh, yeah, hello. I was mostly just going to um, say hello. I'm looking forward to working with you, all you guys and uh, jo joining the CDC. Um, uh, I was also going to ask about just to get a, a gut feel on the, the cost. You, you talked about kind of sharing the cost between um, detection versus control. What, like, what, what are the kind of style, normal costs for that? Like, for it, it just depends on what the detection is and what the control is. So I have to give a, a very um, evasive answer here that if the detection technology is sending out someone to look that costs it costs money because you have to pay for petrol and you have to pay for people's time you might be able to get some economy of scale you can go and look at lots of places which are close by if the detection technology is grinding up um leaf and subjecting them to a genetic test that's going to cost more and you might need to think more about it certainly the the models that i work on often are slightly more abstract so what you might think about is the balance between detection and control costs without quantifying either of them incredibly carefully. So what might be of interest is to say, OK, I want to put 80 percent of my budget into detection and 20 percent into control without really thinking, OK, this is such a handler. I don't know if that's a bit too evasive. No, it's fair enough. OK, thanks. Gregor, uh, please. Hi, Nick. Uh, so my question is about the uh, what I've noticed in your models and, and, and what we could see in these two examples is that uh, citrus canker, uh, you only sort of uh, look at the spatial distribution. That was the only sort of uh, important factor. And, and But in the second case, it was also infection rate, you know, the, 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 the weather, you know, wind speed and, and so on. So, um, so we, how important is that are these external you know environmental factors compared to spatial distribution of the uh, you know, I understand. Of, um so yeah this this also talks to something that richard said about the models being somewhat isotropic and that's a fair critique um that different people do different things here and certainly i have worked on models which can be forced by the wind for example so you can imagine a really quite detailed model of dispersion of a pathogen which knows something about either the wind that's been in history or possibly comes up with some prediction of how windy it might be in in future and you certainly can drive a model that way however all of these models are kind of limited by the amount of data we have for parameterization so the, the, the example i showed you of tim gotwell's data those citrus data that isn't a great deal of data to learn very much about how pathogens spread from mm -hmm. so the, the estimates of dispersal kernels that come out of quite a lot of uncertainty around them. So building a more detailed, you know, trying to add into that uncertainty an additional layer of uncertainty to do with the fact the wind blows in different directions in different days um, it, it is rather difficult. Um, in, in terms of the environment, the environment's incredibly important for plant pathogens. Some of you will know much, much more about plant pathogens than me, I'm sure. But I, I have to stand up and teach plant pathology to, to undergraduate students. And I tell them about the um, what the disease triangle and there's the three sides to that. There's the host and there's the pathogen in the environment because plant pathogens are the archetype of um, organisms which are affected by their environment. If it's too cold, they're not going to spread. And if it's cold, they are going to spread. Whether you get a very small scale, a very, very small scale, a different result out of a model which knew very detailed information about the environment 
and had an infection rate which fluctuated sort of day by day by day by day by day, or a model which had a constant. This is supposed to. This is not coming out quite right because my web camera is clearly not at the entire level. But this is supposed to be horizontal. Whether those would give different results over the ensemble of stochastic runs and with the control is probably more uh, uh, moot. But at big spatial scales, it becomes really important. There are other people who who, who would talk differently to me, though. I should, you know, I, I'll be fair to my field. So there's a group of people next to, in particular, who are incredibly preoccupied by the effect of of, of climate um, mm -hmm. on the spread of path pathogens. Whether you can use that predictively or not, though, I don't know. So that their models are, are they've got the host in, but they haven't got any of the epidemiology. And so, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank interested. you very much. Thank you. Uh, do we have uh, time for another question? Just the final one? Or Please, yes, a brief, okay. brief, brief one This minute. is where you kill me off with the killer question. <laughs> no, no, but I thought maybe to, to bring bring your presentation closer to robotics, yes? So, so, so um, um, imagine that you've got a robot that can build these representations over time, and, and, <clears throat> and uh, but it's got also an apparatus to, to I don't know, spray or, or eradicate particular plants so, so maybe not with trees but but let's say if agricultural crop oh. do you think these models could you see them being utilized by not not, not these models but this class of models so you know I, I may have even talked to some of you around the table about this so as i understand it people are building robots you see like videos of people with tractors that shoot shoot weeds <laughs> that sort of thing yeah. so mm -hmm. people are building robots which take sensing data and from the sensing data, try and infer based on some of the factors that were discussed with Fumio, I think, about uh, what makes a diseased plant, come to some inference about whether an individual plant is infected or not. Well, surely another sort of way of coming to an inference about whether an individual individual plant is infected or not is precisely the risk-based control idea that I showed in my talk. You know, you look at where disease has been before, and then you can come to an inference of what's going to become infected. So surely combining those two into some sort of some kind of whole. There must be an opportunity there. Mm. If anyone on this call wants to discuss that opportunity, I'd be delighted to, because it's an area, an area I've, I've been interested in for a while. Super. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. We are five minutes over, but these were very welcome. Thank you again, Nick, for the no, 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 Sorry that I went on too long, everyone. No, 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 nice that's perfect. You. That's perfect. Thank you very, very much. Perfect. And uh, this is the last. Uh, the last okay. talk of this seminar series. The next one, uh, we will take a break during August, and the next one will be in September, led by the University of Lincoln. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good uh, summer break. <laughs>